Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I, too, enjoyed last year's experience. It was, it was an excellent, excellent experience for me. I, uh, uh, about to rather do this than anything I can think of. Come be with a group of my people, talking about subjects that I like. Uh, just sharing, you know. Um, I've been asked to share a little bit regarding the first step. And... Uh, I worked on the first step for 34 years, you know, <laughs> and you'd think I'd know something about it. <laughs> it just proves you can spend 34 years doing something and not know anything. <laughs> There's a line in the big book that says that uh, we, it, in, in, you know, in our program, there's not a lot of, uh, it's not, in the book it doesn't refer to a lot of must, you know. Uh, some of us would you know, take a little exception to that because uh, that's our bent, but it uh, says that we must concede to our innermost self that we're alcoholics. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty tall order when you stop and think about it, conceding to your innermost self. You know, uh, sometimes we intellectually understand, you know, we're emotionally attached to, we have awareness of, but really, to concede to your innermost self. Now, that's, uh, that's something to pay some attention to. Uh, I was uh, drinking alcoholically long before I ever even became aware of drink. Matter of fact, I never, while I was drinking alcoholically, was aware that I was drinking alcoholically. <laughs> you know, some people call it denial. Uh, I had a term for it, and that is I uh, didn't drink well. <clears throat> I had other friends that drank well. You know, they could have a few drinks and go home and have dinner with their family and, uh, you know, get up the next morning, go to work, and uh, do the same thing the next night. Stop off with the big boys and have a couple of drinks, then go home and have dinner with their family. I used to think I could do that. I would... Uh, stop off and have a couple of drinks, and I'm going to go home and have dinner with my family. You know, I've got a family. I've got a home in the suburbs. I've got uh, business. Things are going well for me. Uh, and I close the joint up, you know, and I didn't understand that. And I go home, and of course, there's problems, you know. And <laughs> over time, those problems fester, you know. Uh, but uh, I didn't understand that. And I, I recall I was uh, I lived out in Plano, north of Dallas, and I was standing there at my fireplace one night, and it was just about dinner time, and I was having a drink, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I've got, there are people all over Dallas, and I've got a lot of friends that they, they will go have a couple of drinks, and then go have dinner with their family, and enjoy it. And why can't I do that? You know? And I just, I'd had the question, but I, you know, I dismissed it right then because I didn't have an answer, and things I didn't have an answer to didn't stay around long with me. You know. <laughs> uh, but I didn't understand the condition at all, and uh, I certainly at that point couldn't concede to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. Our step, uh, I got the Alcoholics Anonymous after going through two divorces and several businesses and. Uh, several geographic moves. Uh, I grew up in an alcoholic home, and uh, early on I got the idea that uh, uh, if anything in life good was ever going to happen for me, it was going to happen because of me. And uh, early, early, early on in life, I had a strong dose of self-sufficiency, you know, that uh, if it was going to be, it was up to me, you know, and I lived my life with that thing. You know, that uh, if it was going to be, it was up to me. And uh, so early on in life, I started uh, proving that out to myself. Uh, I'd certainly been, it had been proved to me that uh, I wasn't going to get any results from my home life, from my parents. And uh, uh, so about the age of 12, while still in school, I started working 
And uh, I, from that time on, I earned all my own money to buy my own clothes or whatever. And, uh, if I went anywhere, it's because I earned the money to do it with. And that, that was the message I had for me. And I started acting on that information early on. <clears throat> and I had obsessions with getting out of the home that I was in and uh, getting out in life and making something out of life for me uh, long before I ever took my first drink of alcohol. And so even though I started drinking at a fairly early age, about age 16, uh, I already had enough obsessions of the mind going on where the alcohol was just one more obsession, but it wasn't even the greatest obsession at that time. Getting out of that home and making my way in life was the greatest obsession I had. And when I graduated from high school, I started uh, in sales business and uh, a few years later started selling insurance and uh, found I could do that pretty well. And uh, by the time I was in my early 20s, I had an insurance agency with quite a number of agents working for me and uh, started building a uh, little Warren Enterprise, so to speak, and uh, um, uh, did well. You know, I had this, uh, we call it here the white picket fence syndrome, you know, that... Uh, I wanted the home in the suburbs, the cars, the nice wife, the 2.2 kids or whatever it was, you know, and uh, I mean, that's, you know, I was going for that, you know, and uh, like I said, if it was to be, it was up to me, you know, and I started proving to myself and others that I could accomplish that. I can very well recall my grandfather uh, had an extreme influence on our lives. He, uh, uh, he worked with my dad. My dad and he went into business in the late 30s together, and uh, from the very time I was a small kid, he was always around, and especially down to our, in our place of business. And uh, uh, so he was always there and commented on things. And as he got older, well, I, and I was a young person, I had to drive him places from, from time to time. And so I, you know, I was very close with him. <clears throat> but I can recall when I first started selling insurance, I went by the, uh, the family business, the bag company, and uh, my brother and I, and uh, I had on a suit, and we were going to go out and make some calls. And here I was just in my you know, late teens, and uh, he, uh, he was sitting there at the office, and he says, and it, working in this bag company, by the way, is extreme labor. You know, and uh, he, uh, he told me, he says, why don't you boys go get you a real job? Because <laughs> that uh, going out and, and selling uh, or uh, you know, wearing business clothes and going out like that just really did not, appeal to him as real work. You know, why don't you go get you a real job, you know? And uh, I've thought about that a lot of times as the years have gone by. <laughs> you know, some of them will do that. <laughs> <laughs> but not today. <laughs> uh, but I had a real dose of self-sufficiency, and I went about trying to, uh, to make something out of my life and, and having a good life, and I did, have, I did have a good life. You know, immediately I started having some success, and... Um, by the time I was 25, I had a pretty successful agency within this company. That It was a relatively small company, but we were selling out of insurance. And uh, uh, I had a pretty substantial agency in East Texas and uh, had a lot of success come my way and uh, good things happened. Alcohol was not a big problem to me at that time. Although when I drank, I didn't drink well. You know, not every time, but I didn't drink well enough of the time that it was uh, my then wife would complain significantly. Of course, she didn't drink at all, so I figured she had no right. She didn't understand. <laughs> uh, but uh, I had the two kids in the home in the suburbs and the cars and all that stuff. And uh, uh, I made some changes in my business from time to time. I, I, you know, it got to going so good in East Texas, I decided I'd bring it to the city. I did, and that, was a, uh, that did not work out well at all. So I went back to East Texas and got it going again good. And, uh, and I did, my brother wanted to get in business with me, so we decided we'd go to West Texas and open up an operation out there. And we did, and I don't know when we got out there, and it didn't work out well. But along the line there, I had started drinking more and more. I also started taking pills more and more. And uh, uh, I didn't recognize, as we would today, any of the symptoms at all of what was going on with me. Uh, so I had a lot of, over the a, a number of years from the late 60s through the mid-70s, I had a lot of ups and downs in business. I could get it going good, but I couldn't keep it going well. And uh, it would, you know, I could get business up and going, 
and then, you know, either things would get real good and I'd celebrate too much, or it'd get real bad and you'd fall off the earth, you know. And it was the same way in my personal life. Uh, marriage was rocky, up and down, and uh, I think it was 1974, I got a divorce after a 15-year marriage, and immediately we married again, but the second marriage didn't last very long, it lasted about two years. Uh, in 1974, I had an opportunity to go to Dallas and, and put in a, a marketing operation with a, a group of people. Not that they, it was co-owned, my part was owned individually, but uh, uh, there were several different units and I owned one unit of it. And uh, uh, I knew at that point that uh, I needed to straighten up big time and I needed to really focus my attention on my business and get it going. I need to focus my attention on my, my family and, and uh, because it was coming apart, and I did. And uh, it doesn't, I think, uh, oh, somewhere around August of 74, I guess it was. And um, uh, so I did that for about six months. I just paid attention to business and family, and uh, things, you know, got going well. We got the new operation up and going, and good things were happening again, and you know, couldn't complain. A little bit irritable from time to time. A little discontent from time to time. But, you know, it's a lot stressful getting a new operation up and going, isn't it? You know? Uh, some of the guys that I worked with were stopping by and having a couple of drinks before dinner. You know, I'm going home after work, you know. Uh, you know, things are going well now. We've got it up and going. Why don't I just do that? You know? So I did that. And uh, I'd stop off and have a couple of drinks, and we'd chat, you know, uh, with the guys. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. People do that all over the world. Except some of them would want to go on home, you know. And, uh, <laughs> hell, I'm just starting, you know. And uh, most of the time, I don't go home. Now, the first few times, uh, I call home, and I'll be home shortly. We're, we're in a conversation right now, but it'll be over in just a few minutes, and I'll come on home. And, uh, but I didn't. You know, uh, I intended to. When I made the phone call, I intended to go home. You know. Well, a little later on, I'm uh, I'm making the I'm not making the phone call because I don't want to have the argument. Later, <coughs> you know, and then uh, sometimes I just don't go home. Yeah. That's those are solutions. You know, <laughs> you just don't go home. <laughs> uh, I didn't understand that at all. I didn't understand what was going on at all. Uh, I thought that I had a few drinks. And I made a decision that I'm enjoying this, and I just want to stay, you know. And uh, I kind of like that life, so I'm just going to stay longer, you know. And I'm not really thinking that much about consequences at that point, you know. Uh, matter of fact, I'm not thinking. Now that we think about it, I'm just drinking. I'm not thinking. I'm drinking. <laughs> uh, but life's a shambles for this time. It, it doesn't take very much longer than that, about another year of that going on, and life's a shambles. I've, I've gone through a divorce, I've remarried, uh, my business is becoming a, a shambles again, and uh, things are not well. The, this second wife, she, you know, my, my script called for me to have home in the suburbs, two kids, wife, cars, you know, that kind of stuff. And so right after the divorce, shortly thereafter, I remarried. Uh, she's got a child, and I go back to my previous family, and I pick up one of my children, so now we have two children, uh, move home in the suburbs, you know, I mean, within a short period of time, I just put all that back together, so that part looks pretty good, it's not doing well, but it looks okay, you know, and uh, uh, I get on about the Mike Warren lifestyle of the day, you know, whatever that was, uh, but things weren't going well. And within a, a year, we're having a lot of problems. Uh, her son and I are not getting along too well. We send him to live with his father. Uh, in a few more months, we're going to a psychiatrist for marriage counseling. Uh, business is not going well. Just, you know, everywhere I look, it's falling apart. Uh, a few more months go by, and I move into an apartment in Dallas. And uh, uh, from the time I moved into this apartment by myself in Dallas, and I send my son to live with his mother. She's uh, in California at the time. And uh, uh, from 30 days after I moved into the apartment by myself is about all I last. Uh, I start drinking 
every night I'd go in every, every afternoon. I, I really wanted to get the marriage back together. So I'd go in and I'd start drinking in the evening. And uh, I'm not going out. You know, I'm staying in, not going to the bars. And uh, uh, I drink myself to sleep each night. And sometimes I'd wake up at night and drink myself back to sleep. Next morning, get up early and go to work. And I did that for about a month. And in the middle of July of 1977, uh, my brother invites me to go to dinner one evening. Now, my brother and I drank a lot together, and I know when he invites me to go to dinner, that does not mean let's go to dinner. That means let's go drinking, you know, and partying. And uh, so I said, well, I have to call you later and let you know. He works with me. So I go home, my typical 4 or 5 o'clock, and I'm pacing the floor in my apartment and uh, arguing with myself about whether to go drinking with him or not. And uh, uh, after a little bit of argument, I call him and I go. And I didn't understand until after I came to you people what, uh, what happened. Uh, but I went drinking with him. And uh, the next morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm driving home with the windows rolled up in my car, screaming to myself about the condition of my life. And I didn't understand how a person with all the resolve on earth could start off the way I did and work like I had and wind up in the snake pit I wound up in. I did not understand that at all. You know? uh, I can't tell you what happened the rest of that week because I don't know. I can tell you what happened the following Sunday. That Sunday afternoon, I uh, was in my apartment and uh, uh, as clear a thought as I'd ever had came to me. Uh, well, it's really two thoughts. One of them is that I do not know how to live life. I'd given life my very best shot over and over and over again, and I didn't know how to live life. And the second thought that I didn't understand at all was that the conditions in my life were of my own making. And I didn't understand that one little bit. You know, when you spend all those years being a victim, how the hell are you going to understand a thought like that? You know, you just don't. Uh, I had big problems, and I had no answer. Here I am at the bottom of the barrel. I look around me, and my life is an absolute failure in every area of life that is of any concern to me. I'm a failure as a business person, as a husband, as a father. I'm a total failure in all those areas. And those are the areas that mattered to me. So I had, And I had those problems, and I had no solution. The next morning, I'm driving to work early in the morning, and another thought comes to my mind is that my mother and my mother-in-law have had lots of difficulties in their life. And somehow they managed to live past them. And so it occurred to me that maybe I'd call one of them, which is a real strange thought for me. Because if, you know, if I, a week before that, had I called either one of them, which I wouldn't have, it would have been to see if they needed my counsel about anything. Because you know, that's kind of where I came from. Well... My mother lived about 50 miles away, so I decided that, that I, and my mother-in-law lived there in Dallas, so I decided I'd give her a call my mother-in-law. And uh, she agreed to see me. I didn't know whether she'd see me. Her daughter was divorcing me. And uh, about uh, 2 o'clock that afternoon, I went over to visit with her. And I went over what was going on with me and all the guilt and remorse I felt about the condition of my life. And uh, uh, she just looked at me. She says, Mike, did you ever think that maybe you're an alcoholic? And um, I, I, I hadn't. My father was an alcoholic, and I knew how he drank and what that looked like. And I drank very different than that. I didn't look like that. I had a different look, so therefore I didn't associate myself with being the alcoholic like him. And I said, I don't know. And uh, she had, about a year before that, gotten in Alcoholics Anonymous, and her life started uh, turning around and shaping up. And so she invited me to go to a meeting about Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, that was 
service on Monday, and she was going on Wednesday. So on Wednesday evening, I went to uh, uh, my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I enjoyed what I heard. I couldn't tell you what I heard, except for one thing. And that is, if you're here, you don't think right. And I heard that. Uh, I could have stood and argued with that, but I didn't think it would do any good in the condition I was in. <laughs> uh, but I, I liked what I saw. I saw a group of people that had similar situations to mine, similar problems to mine, and they seemed to be living past it. So I, with a, a great deal of resolve, decided that going to meetings about Alcoholics Anonymous was a good thing for me to do. And uh, so I decided, since then, that was on a Wednesday evening, that I would go back each Wednesday evening and hear what they had to say. You know. And I did. Uh, <clears throat> for about six weeks. And uh, Labor Day weekend, I was down by the swimming pool. I, had, I didn't drink during that period of time. Uh, down by the swimming pool at my apartment. And a fellow that I'd gone to high school with, who also lived in his apartments, offered me a beer. And uh, I refused it. Then about 20, 30 minutes later, he offered me another one. And the next thing I recognize is that uh, I've drank about half that beer. And it scared the hell out of me. And so I went up to my, I left it and went up to my apartment. And I had a little talk with me, and uh, uh, it seemed that I could make a decision, that I could go back down and drink that beer and continue living like I used to live, or I could go get in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and maybe I wouldn't have to live that way anymore. By then, I'd seen enough people, heard enough stories that I knew that people didn't have to live that way, you know. And see, up until then, I didn't know there was hope, but I had seen hope. I got, in my own mind, I got the Alcoholics Anonymous, not understanding my powerlessness over alcohol, but knowing that I didn't know how to live life. You had other words for it. My life had become unmanageable. So I consider myself to have gotten Alcoholics Anonymous on the last half of the first step. Uh, there never was a time that my life was manageable by me. I just thought it was. I just thought it was. Now that was soon be 19 years ago. My life is just as unmanageable for me today as it was then. Nothing's changed about that. I'm just as powerless, as powerless over alcohol as I was then. The discovery for me since that time has been, one of the great discoveries, has been is that I am powerless, period. I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm powerless over guilt, fear, love hate, uh, lust, my finances, uh, I'm powerless over people, places, and conditions. Of myself, I have no power. There's another line in the book that says that the purpose of this book, talking about the book, big book about Alcoholics Anonymous, is help us to find a power that will solve our problem. At that particular point, it's not describing our problem. It's, it's going to help us find a power that will solve our problem. The middle of July of 1977, my problem was alcohol. You know, I've had many, many problems, if you will, since that time. Alcohol hasn't been one of them because I haven't had a drink of alcohol. If I took a drink of alcohol, then I'd have a drink alcohol problem, I promise you, because you know, I am an alcoholic. But I've had many other problems. I'm just as powerless over them. Uh, <clears throat> I think the great solution for me to date is the certain knowledge that I'm absolutely dependent upon God for everything in life. 
I'm dependent on God for the next breath I breathe. I'm dependent on God for me not taking a drink of booze today. I'm dependent on God for the kind of business I've got, what business I'm in or not in, you know. I'm, uh, everything, I'm dependent on God. The steps helped me to realize that. The first step helped me to go in, get going in that direction. And the other steps, for me, has helped me just become more and more aware of that. My activities in daily life continue to prove that out to me. Is that of the, the fact of my powerlessness and the fact of my absolute dependence on God. But I said, when I got here for all my life, for the first 34 years of it, I was, uh, I had just the, this self-sufficiency complete. I mean, like I said, if it was to be, it was up to me, and uh, you want to help me, thank you, but I'll just have to do it myself, you know. I depended on others, and it didn't work out, you see, you know, so I'll just have to do it myself. And uh, that's that's a bad thing to be in. When you're in that mode, you just, you're not much help for a guy like that, you know. There's just not much help for a guy like that until they concede to their innermost self that they're powerless. You know. And... Uh, some days, you know, some days I'm involved in this activity of living out here, just like most of us are. And some days I don't see that quite as clearly, and I have to go on through the actions until I see it clearly. Because I'm going to have to see that clearly, my powerless over whatever, you know. And I think that's the great lesson in life for me. Uh, as I said, I'm, I enjoyed last year. I'm looking forward to this year, and I'm looking forward to all the comments and the, the, the other speakers related this weekend's uh, program. I thank you. I'm Beverly, and I'm a very grateful member of Al Anon. Hi. Hi. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this weekend. Um, last year, uh, when people came back from here, a lot of people shared with me about what a great, great spiritual and, and loving and filled with fellowship kind of a weekend this was, and I think it's a real privilege and a real opportunity for me to be here. My step is step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Uh, in this step, the thing that I, I don't know, it's, it's really all about miracles for me, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life as a child and um, what that was like and how it, it got to be different once I got into the program of al -Anon. Uh, I was introduced to religion religion when I was five years old. My mother um, got up one day and said I was going to go to church with my aunt. And um, for the next uh, five years, I got up every Sunday morning. I was asked to get up every Sunday morning, and I was taken off to the Catholic <coughs> Church with my aunt. My mother and dad didn't participate in, um, in any kind of religion. God was not spoken about in our family unless it was to reprimand us, you know, and it was a real negative thing. It was like it was manipulative. She would she would say, God's going to get you for that. Or if you do that, God's going to get you. And so I, from a very early age, you know, thought that this God, you know, was a really uh, a bitter, uh, very mean person who had a score pad and kept score. And I've heard that throughout Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous ever since I've been here, but I really experienced that. When I was in kindergarten, my mom um, gave, turned me over to my aunt one more time, and she sent me to a Catholic school. And my interpretation of a Catholic school was a, a little strange because I was fearful. Um, I had already been told, you know, that this God was going to get me, and here were these women dressed in these long black robes, and you couldn't see their hands, and you didn't know if they had hair, and the whole experience to me was really a very fearful thing. So um, by the time I finished my, um, when I was finished with kindergarten the next year, I must have raised some kind of a stink about that or they could tell that I was frightened, I don't know which, but they ended up putting me in a public school and then I went to catechism and I made my first Holy Communion and I did, you know, confirmation and all those things. Um, but nonetheless, it was still about learning about a religion and I didn't know anything about a God. Uh, as, as I was growing into my teens, most of my activities were centered around things that kids did in churches. Uh, that, you know, back when I lived, there, there just wasn't a whole lot to do, so the churches had activities, you know, um, 
each one, the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church. And so all that I did was follow my friends around to these different um, church youth activities. And, and you know, and I enjoyed myself. It, it was a lot of fun. And um, I was there basically seeking um, the, the fellowship, you know, just to have friends and, and just, you know, it was just to be a part of something. Um, when I was uh, going to get married to my husband, by now, by, and still at this time, God was not anything that was sacred to me. God was not a word that you would use in a time of trouble. It was not, it was just, it was really all about religion and knowing the rules and what to do and, and how to, how to um, act when you were in church. Um, when George and I went to get married, I went to see the Monsignor, and I said, you know, I'm going to get married, and he said, great, and this guy's not Catholic, and that's okay, and we're going to do whatever you have to do, and I promised to raise my children Catholic, and when he found out that my husband had been married before, he said, you can't get married in our church, and so it was like one more time, you know, I had this this feeling like, you know, God was out to get me, and um, we ended up getting married in, in my living room by a justice of the peace, and we've been married almost 35 years, so it wasn't any big deal. <laughs> um, you know, I married an alcoholic, and it, where we got married was not, the, you know, wasn't the focus. It was, uh, we got married on November 11th in a dry state, so getting in enough liquor was really the thing that we were most concentrated on, not the bride, not the justice of the peace, not anything. It was just how much liquor was going to be down there, because by God, if they ran out, there was nowhere to go, you know. So that was the focus. Um, George was mar- was raised in a, in a f- family that was um, Latter-day Saints. He was raised in Utah, so he was raised in a Mormon environment, and they were very, very church-oriented. He had, his whole family went off on missions and, you know, did all those things, and I obviously married the black sheep. And, <laughs> and um, I don't know how he kept that secret from them, but he did. And, and you know, I have a box of letters from his mother that I read about 10 or 12 of them, and I got so furious. One of these days I'm going to go back again. But I hid all the insanity. I would just, I would write these darling little bubbly letters to his mother telling her how wonderful everything was. And we're just, I mean, our life is just falling apart at home. And, you know, here I get these box full of letters back after she died. And when I read them, I thought, my God, you know, I was just protecting us and making it all sound like we were wonderful. You know, the whole facade, the whole act that we do. So when George, um, when we were married a few years and our children were about five and seven, we got a promotion to um, uh, Pennsylvania. And I had some demands on this. I said, I want a washing machine and a dryer, and I want to take my kids to church. And I want, to, and I want control of the checkbook. Something was not going right there. And so it was like he wanted to take me back there. He wanted this promotion so bad. He was willing to do just about anything. He turned over the checkbook. I got my dryer, and we started to go to church. <laughs> and um, the kids hated it. I mean, it, it, it was just it, we drove an hour to get there. It wasn't a very big Mormon community in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And it was um, it was not too long before they just kind of just got hold of us. And the next thing we were doing things we didn't really want to do. Like I just wanted to take my kids to church on Sunday, and and you know next thing I know you know we're doing brownies and Girl Scouts, and he's home teaching and doing and all. And after a period of two years, our life just kind of fell apart. I mean he's on the road and I'm on the road, and the kids are screaming they don't ever want to go back there. And so the way that we solved that problem was um, we went to a birthday party with a neighbor, had a couple of drinks, and he came home with an Arctic cat snowmobile. <laughs> and, um, and we just took off into the woods for the next two years. And the closest encounter that I had to God up, up until that time literally was in the mountains on a Sunday morning, you know, in the, in the quiet snow. And, and there was, we had a lot of fellowship with people that we just loved and adored. And, and a lot and a family took us under their wing and, and you know you would not have known that our last name didn't match theirs. I mean they invited us to everything. So that's what we did for the next um, period of time. You know it was just and alcoholism was progressing and uh, you know our lives were unmanageable and, and the kids don't want to ever step foot in another church as long as they live and, and there's no God in my life and I'm telling my children it's the same way my mother told you if you two fight God's going to get you. And then Stephen would come home, he'd have fallen off of his bike, and he'd have cinders in his arm and, you know, and need a few stitches, and I'd say, that's what you get. I told you God was going to get you, because that's what you get for doing that to your brother. So it, that's, you know, and I didn't know, I mean, that's, I'm, 
I don't know, but I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room who had that kind of an environment where it was about some religion and you had some vague idea about something. But I certainly had no concept of a loving God until I got here. In 1981, we were miraculously introduced to Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous, and we had not even made so much as a phone call. I mean, there we were, you know. And the only messenger that God sent to me was a lady that I worked with at the bank. Her son got into some big trouble with drugs and alcohol one weekend. He almost died of an overdose. She took about three days off work, and when she came back, I asked her what had happened. And we were close enough friends, of course. I mean, we're both got, we go both got into this insanity. So, I mean, we were like birds of a feather, but we didn't know what, what we were attracted to. And I asked her where she had been. And she told me, she says, um, it's not really a good thing, and I'm, I'll only tell you, promise she won't tell anybody else. So she told me about her son and what had happened and that he almost died over the weekend, but he did survive, and they were sending him up to Denton to a treatment center. And as she was sharing with me what was happening with her son and the reason that he ended up in the, in the jam he got in, uh, a little crack, you know, that little, that, well, just a little window started to break, and I thought, my God, you know, these things are going on in my house. But well, I shut that door just as quick as I could because I thought, if I even acknowledge that, I'm not a good mother. I haven't raised these children well. Um, you know, I'm not a good wife to my husband. I, I just couldn't take a look at what was really going on. Occasionally, I would address the alcoholism right on and say, this bottle used to be this full, and now it's only this full. And they had me convinced that even with the cork on, it evaporated. <laughs> And, you know, I would go into the refrigerator and check the cans of beer, and they would all be accounted for. But what I didn't realize is it took him two and a half hours to go to the hardware store, and when he got back, he was drunk. And, and, I, and I, then I would say to him, you seem to be drunk to me, and he would say, not at all, you know. <laughs> And then he would fall off ladders and do a lot of other insane things. And, you know, and so when this lady is telling me these things, I knew in my heart that I was relating to her. But I didn't want to, to relate to her because I didn't want to be a failure. It was so important to me because perfectionism was one of the really big deals of my life. And, I mean, it all had to look just perfect. And, um, you know, it was, it was falling apart, but I couldn't, I couldn't acknowledge it. So I, I started to go to meetings at the request of this woman in the treatment center, and, and when she told me I was going to have to go to this program called, called Al-Anon because my son couldn't come home to an old idea, I told her that she had to be kidding because I worked and my husband didn't come home very much, and, and you know, I just didn't have time for another club. I, now, I had isolated myself completely in my house because if I was there to guard it, they wouldn't throw things at each other and, and they wouldn't fight. You know, I really thought I had some control over the environment of my home um, and I didn't understand anything about powerless. So um, I ended up, because I wanted to, um, I, I thought, you know, I could do anything for 28 days. That would appall me if I had to do it for the rest of my life. So I went to al -Anon. Um When I got there, I found out that there was something there for me. And I was starting to to come to understand that maybe there was something wrong with me. She told me that the Al-Anon often came to the program much sicker than the alcoholic, and I, I couldn't see that at first. But as I sat in the meetings and I listened to people share in the Al-Anon meetings, and I started to hear them share their stories, I thought to myself, you know, finally I allowed myself in that room for one hour to, to relate to them and say, those kinds of things are happening in my house, and maybe this really is alcoholism. So um, on... on um, February 23rd, my husband came into the program. On March 30th, my other son came into the program, and now we're all the whole family is deeply entrenched in this 12-step program. And as I'm starting to do this, I'm thinking to myself, these people are all talking about this power greater than themselves, and all that I know about God is terrifying. And here they are, they're saying they have turned everything, their children, their homes, their finances, their alcoholism, their recovery, everything goes to this God, and that he's all loving, all caring, you know, and, and present, and, and just, and I'm sitting there thinking, no way, I can't do that. So I could admit that I was powerless over the alcoholics and people, places, and things, but now you're asking me to go into an area that has terrified me all my life, and that is to acknowledge the possibility that there was a power greater than myself. 
and I and I didn't even know where to start to look. I, I mean, I just didn't even know where to start to look for that. So um, I set out, and I thought to myself, maybe if I could find a miracle. You know, these people are talking about these coincidences in, in meetings, and I thought, maybe if I could just find one of those, something, you know, maybe the tumblers would click, and I would start to feel some of the things that they were starting to feel. And so I became willing to be willing to find this power, but I didn't know what it was going to look like or, or, you know, how I was going to feel about it. And one day I went, my son was a nice ducker at a grocery store, and I used to give him a check that had a date and my signature on it, and at 6 in the morning when they threw all the groceries into a carton that had been sliced or dented or something, the kids would have an opportunity to buy these things. So he had a check in his pocket so he could buy the groceries. When the check got stale dated, it was two after a couple of days, he'd give me back the old check and I'd give him a new one if he hadn't bought anything. Now the interesting thing about that is, is that I'm a banker, I get my checks free, but the hook was I didn't want to write void in my, in my check register because it would look messy. So I would take <laughs> these checks back and go spend them somewhere, you know, at the Tom Thumb so that I didn't have to void it out in my book. Now what happened on this day that I found God was I lost the check before I got to the grocery store. And it's made out to the Tom Thumb, and it's got my signature on it, and it's dated, and I and it, and the amount is empty. Both amounts are empty. And when I got to the checkout stand, you know, and realized that the check that I was going to write for the groceries was gone, I promise you I was terrified because I worked in a bank and I knew the trouble I was in with that. I also knew that when I walked out of that bank, the doors were closed and there was no way that I could stop payment on that check until mor until morning. And I got home and, you know, I was just trying to figure out something I could do, somebody that I could call, something I could do, and there was nothing I could do. I was totally powerless over that check. When I got home, I, I, I thought, okay, well, you can't stew about this until morning. You know, you're, you're powerless over the check. I got step one down, okay. So I thought to myself, okay, what's the thing that they tell you the next in Al-Anon to do, and that is to do the next right thing. So I opened up the vegetable crisper and I started to peel potatoes and believe it or not, that was a surrender. And I didn't know it at the time, but letting go of the check long enough to open up the drawer and pull the potatoes out was a surrender and God, God heard me apparently because at that very moment the telephone rang and the ladies, there were two ladies in my bank that sat all day long and they filed checks. That's all they did was look at the signature, look at the card, drop the check in the drawer and they did that for eight hours every single day. And one of the ladies that was one of the check filers called me on the phone, and she says, Beverly, this is Gracie. You have got to be the dumbest employee First City Bank has ever hired. She said, I can't believe you have a check made out to a grocery store, and you've signed it, and you lost it. And I says, well, Gracie, how did you know I lost the check? Well, she said, I'm in Walmart, which is where I went before I went to Tom Thumb, and she says, I'm standing in the checkout counter, and this was before they stamped the little payee thing on the back of it. So it's just a blank piece of paper. It's laying on the tile floor at the checkout counter. Gracie looks at it, and because she does nothing but file checks all day, she says to herself, that looks like a check. And she picked it up off the floor, and, and it was my check, you know. So she goes home and calls me up. Now, I had to be humiliated by her telling me that I was, without a doubt, the dumbest employee that they'd ever hired at the bank. But the fact of the matter is, is that was beyond any coincidence that I had ever encountered. And when she hung up the phone, I sat in my kitchen and I just wept. I, I mean, I, could, I just wept. And, and, and I thought to myself, that's what they're talking about. I mean, that's, that was a burning bush as far as I was concerned, but that's what they're talking about, is this God can do anything. He can find lost checks. And at that point, I sat down... <laughs> And I started to think about other things because I had become open. At that very instant, I became open. And what I realized next was that all four members of my family were sitting in Alcoholics Anonymous in Al-Anon, and we never made a phone call. I mean, I've got a 15-and-a-half-year-old and a 17-and-a-half-year-old kid that are sober, and they're doing the, they're doing the deal. And, and my husband's got a sobriety chip, and I'm going to Al-Anon, and I'm willing to stay there. The 28 days are up and I'm sitting there and I am really enjoying being there. I'm understanding it. It's the first time that I felt at home 
It's the first time somebody put their arms around me since my grandmother died. You know, that was not my husband and said, I love you. We, you made us feel precious and, and so welcome. And, and, you know, I wasn't here because I was wanted to get spiritual or I wanted to get well. I was here because I was hungry for the fellowship for a long time. And um, so that's how the process began for me. It was just, it was the most, it was like the whole, like an earthquake in California where everything just kind of shifted for me. As time went on um, and I came to believe in these miracles and that this God was real, I still didn't know whether, you know, it was, he was working for me. Now, here I had these things, you know, but until I was, it it, it just is a process. It takes a long time to begin to trust that power and know that it really has you in mind. So um, I had to do a little exercise in in having some faith, and um, what happened was, um, Scott started to drink again shortly after he was sober. He didn't experience a very long period of sobriety. And so one of the things that you told me to do was to make my hands like this and place Scott in my in my hands and visualize those hands real big and, and you know, weathered and loving and kind, you know, and, and to place Scott in those hands and know that God would take care of him. Because as it turned out, we ended up having to put him out for a while and then he came home and we went he went into treatment. And, and um, you know, so... There was many, many, many times when I had to let go of Scott and put him in God's hands. Um, there was came a period of time where George's um, his work situation changed and our finances changed. You know, one more time, you know, I had to think God can take care of this. You know, his, he's in charge, and you kept telling me, you know, Beverly, you just get up and you and you walk forward this day, and it's going to be all right. And it has been all right. You know, he's been, it, it, it's 10 years later, and, you know, we've never missed a meal, and everything's been wonderful. But I spent a year really fretting about that, being, you know, having the willingness to turn, you know, to, to believe in this power greater than myself enough to be w- willing to turn that over to, to God. Um, after my um, granddaughter Sarah was born, and I went down to Florida to see her for the very first time, my son was in very, very active alcoholism and drug addiction. And my daughter-in-law, you know, was reacting to him violently. And, and their life was truly unmanageable. And Scott decided to work two jobs so that Doreen could stay home with the baby for a couple of months. And I stayed there for about five days or six days, I don't know. But when I got ready to leave, I had to do this again. I had to place that child in God's loving, loving protection and know that no matter what, she was going to be all right. That there was many of us that were raised in alcoholic homes and that, you know, we all are survivors and we become strong. And, you know, and that my, my little grandchild, even though she was just a couple of days old, she was going to be okay because God, um, was going to take care of her. And I was able, with some degree of peace and serenity, get on that airplane and leave that baby in Florida and come home. I came to a point where I understood what grace was and how I walked in grace and how God loved me personally. And I got, you know, I walk around today and I say things like I'm God's favorite child and it's, that's just the way it is and I know it because I have been blessed many times over. I mean, over and over and over and over, uh, you know, and I know that I'm special and, and it's wonderful to feel special. I had to learn what it meant to be still and know that I am God. There's all these little things that come around here, but you know, what it took for me was an experience with each instance that made it my own. So I had to learn that in order to get through what I've walked through for the past five or six years, that I had to get still and know that there was a God because we ended up having to walk through some things that were really difficult to get through. And I had to know um, that I had a willingness to do this prayer and meditation, to be really quiet for a specified period of time every day and have an intimate relationship with this power that I was willing to come to believe in. And I don't know how long it's been. It could be ten years now that there's not very many mornings. I mean, very few mornings. It's only when we get up and take off real early in the morning that I don't actually do a period of time of prayer and meditation. And I'm willing to sit there and, and see if God has anything to say to me. And it's been real interesting because over the years, this power that I've been willing to come to believe in has spoken to me personally. And he has guided me and I have gotten direction. And I know what to do. You know, a lot of times I just really do know what to do. Um, it was, I, I said to, to know that God really cared about me and about my children. The insanity that I suffered before I got here 
um, was it had to do with anger. It had to do with loneliness. It had to do with feeling like, you know, I got married to this man and I didn't know he had alcoholism until we actually got here. And so I didn't know what I was dealing with. My father was an alcoholic. My father's father was an alcoholic. My mother's father was an alcoholic. So it's not that we were the first generation to end up with alcoholism. It was something that was passed on to us for a long time. But I didn't know what it was and it made me angry and resentful. And when you're angry and resentful and you're burdened with something that you don't know what it is, you are, you are insane. The people who took the brunt of my insanity before I got into the program of Al-Anon with my children because they were the two people that were home with me alone and they got, they got it all. And, um, you know, as a, as a result of that, I embarrassed them in front of their friends, you know, and, and caused a lot of embarrassment for them and for myself. Um, the insanity of my actions was, in, was the inability to make choices the inability to have compassion, the inability to feel loved, the inability to love others. And um, all this caused a lot of confusion for me. But in the program, you know, you've taught me how to love people, how to love myself, to have compassion not only for myself but for my fellow man. And as I've walked through, you know, I think even having learning how to have compassion takes a, a, a jolt in your life where you where you see something that's just so unbelievably difficult to walk through that no matter what happens, now I have so much compassion for my fellow man, you know, no, no matter what, my heart is so open now, and that's painful too, you know, it, it, sometimes I think to myself it was a whole lot easier when I couldn't feel anything, and, and now I, one, of my, one of my dear friends moved yesterday, you know, and, and I just, I had a real hard time with that, but people have come and gone out of my life, and all of a sudden now, you know, this I'm feeling this pain inside of me, and I thought, I know it'll heal, and she's going to a neat place, and she I will always carry this lady close to my heart. But, you know, the, the, just the, the feeling inside of me that I feel weakened by this is, is an amazing thing to me. It's, um, it, I have never been able to feel like that. Um, there were a lot of tools that helped me to find this God. You know, there were there were. Al-Anon literature and tapes and sponsorship and going to meetings and doing the prayer and the meditation. And I learned from you that you told me God spoke through people. And I go to a meeting today and I rely on that. I always get an answer. No matter what's going on with me, I'll go to a meeting and find out that God speaks through somebody and, you know, the answer will come. One of the best, one of the, one of the most awesome things that happened, um, last September my daughter-in-law gave me permission to, to speak about my son's illness openly. And up until that time, we had to, um, we, we just didn't talk about it. We, um, they said don't. You know, it was hard. We had this little child, and, and you know, there, there's a lot of criticism and, and about the illness that he died of, and, and so it, they said keep it a secret. So I picked six or eight people and, and had a little circle of friends who knew that my son had AIDS, and at any time, any time that I needed to talk about it, I called one of these people. And, um, and I shared with them, but as far as being in a meeting or anything, it was my son, you know, had some serious health problems. So, you know, and that's how I got through that. And it was hard not to be able for everybody in the room because you all would have given me a lot of strength and a lot of courage. But we were going by the guidelines of society and they said, don't talk about it. So we didn't talk about it. But my daughter-in-law heard a man speak in September and as a result of that, when we got up to our room that night, she said to me, Nanny, I want you to be able to talk about God because she says, you were very courageous and I was very courageous. People need to know because this is not something that's going to go away tomorrow. So when I was faced with the first time that I was going to talk about my son's age, I really got scared and I had this idea that I'm not going to go, I'm not going to do it, I can't do it, there's no way. I, I just didn't know where I was going to get the courage and the strength to do that. And I go to my little Thursday meeting and, and I'm sitting there and every Buddy in that room that day affirmed something that I needed to hear to make me strong enough to get on the airplane the next day and be willing to go out there and talk about my son's illness in front of 600 people. And, you know, I thought about that and I thought to myself, God is so loving because here I was ready to throw the towel in on that and he provides me an entire home meeting with all of these people who shared something regarding having courage, having coming out of, one girl said she's been going secretly through a divorce and that, you know, she's out of the closet. You know, this word, I mean, how many times do you hear that word? Um, Nancy shared about Shep's death and, 
and she said something that really touched me, and then Jenny shared something, and, and it just went around the table that day, and I walked out of there feeling strong and knowing that I had a purpose and that God wanted me to do that. So, um, you know, there's, I, there's so many things. When I found out that Scott had AIDS, I also found out a couple of weeks before that that my father was dying of cancer, and I had a sponsor who said, you better write a miracle down in your journal every day. You better know that this God is present and available for you every single minute. And I started that day writing a miracle down at the top of my journal, and I still do that today. Because, see, my answer to her that day was, that's a big order. God does not give you a miracle a day, but I'm here to tell you that every moment that we're alive and we're breathing, we are given miracles. You know, I, they're not burning bushes, but, you know, they're just, they're little things. They're just little things, and they're there. And the more that I practice the presence of this God in my life, the, the more ability I have to see on a day-to-day -day basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, just how gracious this God is that I have come to believe in. And, you know, it's just, it's, I'm in awe of it most of the time. It's, it's, it's just the most incredible thing to have, to, to just know that, that everything's in order. You know, everything is in divine order. Um, when I first started to believe in this God, they also said my foundation had to be strong. And, um, and that I needed to go back to a time when I didn't believe in God and find evidence of God in my life. And so I went back there and I tried to find these things. And the one thing that I thought about was when my children were just little, three and five, we bought our first little house and it was in December. And I'm crossing an interstate highway in, in Ogden, Utah. We had a pickup truck with a choke on it. And just as I, I stopped at a stop sign that was on a slope, and just as I started to crest and go over the interstate, and at that time we literally crossed over the interstate, my truck died. And George was in a car in front of me, and I, you know, for this moment I panicked about what I was going to do, and I could see the headlights of a semi coming. And I'm sitting in a pickup truck, broadside on an interstate, you know, and I had clarity. I had... I, I turned off the lights. I can remember step by step what I did, and all of a sudden that old truck started, and I got it across the interstate, and I remembered that once I got it across the interstate, I parked on the shoulder, and I couldn't drive for a very long period of time because my knees were jumping and my hands were jumping, and I thought to myself, that was God. You know, who but a power greater than myself could have moved that truck that night? And I thought about a house that we sold and how easy it was to sell it so we could move to a new location at a time when George was getting a prom promotion. And I thought about the time I put a baby bottle in a boiling pot of water and set off to take my child to be baptized and left the bottle boiling in the water. And, you know, all of a sudden in the middle of the ceremony, remembered, I, I visualized this boiling <laughs> water and I thought, I said to George, we could have a real problem at home. <laughs> And we did have a real problem at home. But, you know, if that thought hadn't come to my mind, that house could have burned. I mean, we don't know what would have happened. But he left the baptism and went home. You know, everything was black. <laughs> it was black. But it didn't burn, you know, because this thought came to me that, the house, that I had forgotten this in the middle of all that. Um, There was a time when I was pregnant with Stephen. I, it was, I was very pregnant. I was like nine. I was ready to deliver, and I'd gone into labor, actually. And I couldn't get my, my husband to come home from work. He kept, I guess he didn't think how serious this really was. <laughs> and, and I was standing there worried about how all this was going to come out of that little place. And, <laughs> and I was really panicked, and I wanted some help in the kitchen, you know. And I kept calling him, and his people in his office kept saying, you really need to go home, George. She's in labor. You really need to go home. And just at that moment when I'm thinking, you know, what if something happens and I really need to be at the hospital and this guy won't come home from work, the cream of weaver milkman turned up. And he's got five kids, and he looked at me, and he says, Lady, you look like you're in trouble. And he says, and I'm going to stay here till your husband comes home, because he says, if you need a ride to the hospital, we're going to do it in a milk truck, but you're going to get there. <laughs> and, you know, those kinds of things came back to me, and I thought to myself, they were silly. Some of them were silly. Some of them were serious. But they formed a foundation that God didn't begin in Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous. Al-Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous gave me the opportunity to grow on a foundation that I didn't even know was being laid. And I could pile my bricks on it. And, and that no matter what happened, you know, whether it was a storm or, or Scott's death or the things that we have faced over the years, my foundation was so strong that, you know, I, there were days when I didn't feel like I was enough or I had enough. 
But those were the days we got phone calls and letters and, and, a, and dinner and those kinds of things came to us. And a, or a nurse would give us a little bit of courage or, or a new medication would come along that would help Scott through another one of the opportunistic viruses that he was, um, that he was getting on a regular basis. And, you know, there was a lot, it took a lot of courage and a lot of God to, ha to watch for me to watch my son deteriorate before my very eyes. You know, once on Halloween night, he was able to shuffle around the block while we took our little granddaughter trick-or-treating, and three days later, he couldn't walk, and he never walked again, you know. And those kinds of things are so devastating, but without knowing just how strong this God really is, I don't know how people get through that. And maybe that's why there's a lot of the young young people who have AIDS and are at Parkland Hospital and they don't have parents, it's maybe because the parents don't know just how powerful God is. And that watching these children is a very painful thing, but if you're strong inside and know that there is a power greater than yourself working in there, you can get through just about anything. And so, you know, all, all I know is that this power is, you know, it's, it's all that there is today. It's everything that I know. It's everything that I rely on. I think to me today, step two is about a rainbow of possibilities and it offers us a lot of hope. And I was sitting there, um, I, went, I was listening to a, a, a woman speak a couple of weeks ago and she was talking about um, having come out of a gray area that weekend. That she had been in a gray place, it wasn't a bad place, it wasn't a good place, it was just kind of a gray place. And she said it was a resting place. And as I sat there and listened to her, I started to cry again. You know, that's always when God it feels like it just fills me up when the tears just roll down my cheeks and there and I'm not going like that, they're just rolling down my cheeks. And I realized that on December first my daughter in law made a quilt for my son and we went over to Market Hall and we dedicated Scott's AIDS quilt. And it turned out to be the second most emotional day of my life when we put this quilt down on the pile and we walked away from it. And I think as I thought back, as I was listening to her talk, I think I realized that I went into this desert for this period of time because I needed another period of time to rest. And it wasn't that I wasn't happy or couldn't function or do anything. I was just in this kind of resting place. And when I got out of that and I realized that that morning kind of was an opening of the door and I was out and I was free and, you know, life again, that was the morning in my meditation that I, that I heard the words in my heart say that, you know, there were a rain, that it wasn't gray, it had been a rainbow of possibilities. And step two is learning how to trust God. I had always loved God as I was progressing in this program. I loved God, but I trusted people. But what I found out is that people are fallible. People have, we have character defects. That's two of our major steps, six and seven, are all about our character defects. And so I'm trying to put all my all my trust into human beings, and I'm getting disappointed time after time after time. And then this time when I, I was reading something, and it said, suggested that you trust God and love people. And it was like another thing shifted inside of me. And, you know, I'm trying one more time at a deeper level now to trust God and to love people, because if you love somebody, you can overlook their character defects. But God has no character defects to overlook, and with him all things are possible. And so anyhow, step two is about letting go of my control in all areas and handing it all over to God. You know, and I am a very controlling woman. I'm learning and I'm doing a lot better in a lot of areas. But you know, there are still some things I want to hang on to and I want to do, I want to do it my way. And you know, there's always a period of time where I either have to surrender, or surrender or be humbled into some, into some in, into a surrender. It's usually embarrassing when that happens. You know, usually I end up having to have a large dish of crow or something. And so um, the, the program, as far as I'm concerned, I was excited about being given the opportunity to share about Step 2 because God has become incredibly large in my life. And it, and it took a lot of fearful events, you know, my deaths and losing family members and a lot of struggles. But what has happened is I became strong in the broken places, and because of that, you know, I have a stronger reliance on God today than I could have ever dreamed per possible to go from a place where all that I knew was religion to a place where all that I know is that this power is so loving and so kind that he can do anything. And he has restored me to sanity, and I'm very grateful for that. And um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm really honored to have been given an opportunity to share this with you. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.